Acts chapter 10. When the Apostle Paul wrote to the Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 2, and he spoke about the wall of division that existed between the Jew and the Gentile, it's the kind of thing that living in this country, which is really very much a multicultural country, it has a smattering really of everything from around the world uh, that is in the middle of it. We've kind of learned to get along with a lot of different kinds of people. We as a country are literally the superpower of the world in a physical sense. <laughs> Babylon fell in one night. It looked like it was, you know, the great thing, the great Babylon that would never fall. And God could look at it and say it's become so corrupt spiritually that it could be defeated in a single night, and it was. But for outward appearances, we are a, a tremendous military power. So we're not fearful of attack from Canada or Mexico or Europe or Asia or any of these kinds of things. We don't have a long history as Americans as a whole of being an oppressed people. So when we read about him, Paul writing to the, Ro uh, to the Ephesians about this wall of division that's been broken down between Jew and Gentile, it's like, well, that's interesting. I wonder what he's talking about. Maybe he'll, uh, the next verse is better. <laughs> and you move on to it. But the wall that existed between Jew and Gentile was very high and very thick, uh, rivaling the walls of the great city of Babylon. And the Jews had a long history, even by this time in the book of Acts, a long history of being oppressed by the Gentile nations of the world. And of course, uh, it, it became worse and worse and worse right into the last century. But at the time of the book of Acts, the Jews have been, their land has been occupied by Rome and the Roman Empire for about a hundred years. And Rome came in, as is the case with a world-ruling empire, with all of their pride, with all of their haughtiness, with all of their lack of sensitivity, and they walk into Israel. And Israel wasn't unique into this. They walked into the Greece the same way. They walked into Egypt the same way. The same way that any of us would if we were in their place apart from the Lord. And they walked in in all of their pride and all of their arrogance, and they walked up and down these streets as if they owned them, as if they had a long history there. And they flaunted their power all of the time. And this grated against the Jew, because the Romans brought with them their Roman idolatry, their Roman gods, all of these kinds of things. And the Jews... When they looked at, at the Romans, it was just typical of their long history with the Gentiles. And it had been a long history, a hard history, a violent history. And by the time this thing is going on in the book of Acts, in the time that Jesus comes to this world, the Jews not only didn't have dealings with the Samaritans, who were half Jews and half Gentiles, they had only as little contact with the Gentiles as was absolutely possible. And in fact, the teaching of the rabbis in those days was that they would wake up in the morning and their first prayer would be, God, I thank you that I'm not a Gentile, a woman, or a dog. So you have an oppressed people who are looked down upon by the oppressors and they develop the same chip on their shoulder towards the Romans. Until these two groups, they lived side by side because they had to within that land, but they didn't like each other at all. Now, here's the problem that God has. The problem that God has is that he's got a great commission. And his great commission is that his disciples 
would make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them all things, Jesus said, that I've commanded you. And God's vision is to reach the whole world, but at this point in time, the gospel is in the hands of very Jewish apostles. And they got a wall between them and Gentiles before they even want to have anything to do with them. Yet, uh, you know, apart from them struggling at this point with the idea that God even cares to save Gentiles, they don't care to save Gentiles. So how could God care to save Gentiles? But God cares to save Gentiles. And that's why when that baptism of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, Where Jesus said, and you shall receive power to be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And so when they listened to that great commission and they heard it, when they listened to him talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the power to take the gospel into all of the world, they heard it. They just didn't believe it. I mean, of course, God has to love the whole world. (laughs) I mean, we know he doesn't, but I mean, he's got to say it. (laughs) But God loves the whole world. Jesus said all the way back in John chapter 3, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so the Jews now, the apostles, including Peter, they don't understand this about God yet. But Jesus is this patient teacher, isn't he, to walk us into how he views people and how he views this world. Wouldn't it be nice that once you got saved, you're completely sanctified and just like Jesus? Well, it would be nice for us if you did. But the fact of the matter is we don't, do we? We come to know the Lord, and then there's a rather large process that goes on all the way until the time that we go to be with the Lord of changing our thinking into his thinking, our priorities into into his priorities. And so that's what he's going to do. He's going to take these Peter now step by step in order to teach these Jewish disciples of his that he's interested not only in saving Jews, but in saving the Gentiles. Now, he's made some progress here already in the book of Acts because Philip has gone into Samaria, which is kind of half Jew, half Gentile kind of people, that kind of deal. And God has shown an interest in them in saving them and blessing the gospel message to them. They're baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then Philip is taken from Samaria and he's brought on the road uh, to Gaza and meets with the Ethiopian eunuch who is no Jew at all. He's completely a Gentile. But he's a proselyte. He's a convert to Judaism. And, and so they can look at him and say, well, okay, God will deal with, you know, uh, proselytes, but not Gentiles yet. But God's inching them toward the fact that he's interested in saving Gentiles too. And so now he comes to this place in Acts chapter 10 of knocking the whole wall down, huffing and puffing, <laughs> and opening the door of salvation to the Gentiles. Now, there was a certain man in the city of Caesarea. And Caesarea is one of the favorite places when we take a trip to Israel to go to. It's about 30 miles north of the city of Joppa. And Peter, as we saw at the end of uh, Acts chapter 10, Peter is in the city of Joppa. And the city of Joppa is an absolutely beautiful city, too. Both of them sit right on the Mediterranean Sea. And the water is just, just beautiful. And Caesarea was a Roman town. Uh, the Romans had built it there in Israel because they wanted a little bit of Rome uh, far away from Rome. And so Caesarea, it's a complete ruin now. There's no city there now. It's a complete ruin, but it was a, a great, great Roman city. And so in this city, city of Caesarea, there was a man by the name of Cornelius, and he was a centurion of what was called the Italian Regiment. So we're introduced to a man by the name of Cornelius. He is a centurion in the Roman army. A centurion was kind of an officer in the Roman army. He was an officer over 100 soldiers. And so he was, of course, 
Roman. He was a part of the Italian regiment or the Italian band, as it is in the old King James, a famous accordion group that was very, very big back then on the whole thing. You know, Cornelius and Sister Rose, they had that whole thing going. But anyway, here he's... He, but he's a, he's, a, he's a full, he's not a proselyte, or he's not, he's, he's not a, um, uh, like the Samaritans. Or he's, he's a full-blooded Gentile, full-blooded Gentile dog in the minds of, of the Jews. And so he's a centurion. Now, centurion, according to an ancient historian, listen to what this historian says about the qualifications of a centurion. Centurions are desired not to be overbold and reckless so much as good leaders, of steady and prudent mind, not prone to take the offensive to start fighting wantonly, but able when overwhelmed and hard-pressed to stand fast and to die at their posts. That's That's the caliber of person that this Cornelius is. He's a real man's man. And not only that, but he's a devout man, very, very serious about the things of of God, very, very sincere about the things of God, and one who feared God. He had respect and reverence for God. And not only that, but he had carried it over into his entire household. Now, what the Romans did essentially in their worship is they simply Romanized the Greek gods. And the Greek gods were, for the most part, the deification of the emotions in the nature of man. So it's essentially the worship of self, and you could give yourself to all manner of debauchery and call it worship. There would be no conviction because gods, uh, the gods are involved in this. But one of the things that happens is that when a nation or an empire is engaged in the worship of the human flesh and the desires and appetites of the human flesh, it just goes, as we're seeing in our country, each generation it becomes more and more debased. And so what was happening to the Romans was a Roman man like Cornelius would look at the Roman culture and civilization and say, I'm not raising my family in that. I'm not turning my kids over to that stuff. Forget about it. Because now they've had time after a hundred years to see what the Roman philosophy and worship, the kind of person that it was producing. And because it produced such a a, a despicable kind of person, what would happen is the Romans would look over at the Jews and they would see these Jews serious in their relationship with God. And they would see that there wasn't this million gods that you had to keep track of like the Romans. They had one God who was the creator of the heavens and the earth. And that appealed to them. And so they became what the Jews called God-fearers. And that's what Cornelius was. He apparently wasn't a, a, a proselyte into uh, Judaism because to convert to Judaism and become a proselyte was you needed to become circumcised and then begin to honor the Sabbath. Well, uh, typically, a Roman in his position was not going to do that and and often simply didn't have the freedom to do that. He didn't have Saturdays off. (laughs) He's in the military. And, And so, but they would do as much as they could in respect for the God of the Jews, the creator of the heavens and the earth, Yahweh, Jehovah. And so he not only trusted in, in, in believed in the God of the Jews, but now he's raising his whole family this way also with the same respect for God, with the same seriousness concerning the things of God. And not only this, but he was a man who gave alms generously to the people. So he's a man that loves God, but he's also a man who loves people. There's a soft spot in his heart for people. And he prayed to God always. He was a man of prayer. Now, the interesting thing to me is you'd think that chapter 10 would end right there. All right. (laughs) Surely this guy's a Christian. (laughs) Can we have him as our pastor? (laughs) You look at that description of him, and you would think 
Man, there's no need to preach a gospel to him. There's no need for him to be born again. There's no need for this or this or this. The rest of the chapter could just end. But God looks at a man that is even serious about God, devout, raised his family in this way, a man of prayer, a man who loves people, a man who is converted to a religious system and can look at that man and say, that man is still going to miss heaven and is in need of being born again by believing in the Lord Jesus for the forgiveness of his sins. Because as wonderful as that list is, it pales in comparison to that blood. Because nothing compares to that blood. So a person so often today can look and say, you're telling me that a guy that is devout and fears God, raising his whole household in the same religion, gives alms and prays to God it always is not going to go to heaven? Are you trying to tell me that? No, I'm not trying to tell you that. I am telling you that. And God's going to tell you that in the rest of the chapter. And it's one of the most important lessons for people to understand because as we've seen in recent weeks, even on Sunday morning, one of the greatest threats to people coming into a personal relationship with God does not come from sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It comes from getting settled down in a religious system and thinking that that is the way that I can become saved. And that's not the way that I receive the forgiveness of sins. I can only receive the remission of my sins, the forgiveness of my sins, by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ for that forgiveness. That's the only way that it happens. And that's part of what this chapter is all about. So about the ninth hour of the day, which is three in the afternoon, so he is, we'll find out later in the chapter, he is praying at this time. The, third, uh, the ninth hour being three in the afternoon, that's a time where the Jews would be praying uh, over in, in the temple in Jerusalem. So he's honoring kind of this Jewish times of prayer. And while he's in prayer, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. So he's called by name. And when he observed him, Cornelius observes this angel, he was afraid and he said, What is it, Lord? So here's this amazingly brave kind of man, and he sees an angel, and he's all flipped out by it. I mean, the reaction is fear. Now, remember, as a Gentile, the Jews are comfortable with the supernatural for the most part. Not the Sadducees, but the Pharisees were. And they're comfortable with the doctrine of angels and the belief in angels and all these kinds of things. But here he is. He's a Gentile, and he, he, he isn't, you know, uh, probably not versed in these kinds of things. So he sees this angel, and he's frightened. And, and it's a little bit worse. The angel knows his name. And so he said to him, the angel did, Your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. Now, the interesting thing that happens here when he speaks in verse 4 and says, your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. One of the things that God is teaching us in this section of the book of Acts through Cornelius, but also through the Ethiopian eunuch, is that when a man or a woman, any man or woman in this world, is sincere in really coming to know the truth about God. God is going to be faithful, no matter what kind of miracles He has to do, if He has to send an angel, has to give a vision, has to send someone from another city to bring the gospel to them, whatever is necessary for them to come into contact with the truth, He will do that. He'll do that in our lives. I wonder, as you know your own testimony here tonight, how many of us can look and once we became saved, recognize how supernaturally God had worked the events to keep us coming into contact with the truth, knowing that we were sincerely seeking the truth about life and about death and about eternity. And so you've been praying. You're a true seeker. Your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. So here's what you need to do. Send men to Joppa. And send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He's lodging with Simon a tanner, whose house is by the sea. And so here's Simon Peter. He's residing, residing in a tanner's house 
there in Joppa. Now, this is interesting, too, because to be a tanner was in those days is the same as it is this day. You're, you're tanning the hides of dead animals. Now, for a Jew to touch a dead animal, that rendered you ceremonially unclean. And in fact, according to some Jewish teaching, according to some rabbis, if you were married to a tanner, or you, here you married this guy and he's a, you know, uh, w- you know a, uh, a tailor, like out of, uh, uh, what's the name of that movie? Fiddler on the Roof, thank you. And, uh, it, it, and then all of a sudden he decides, I'm going to go into becoming a tanner. That wife had grounds for divorce <laughs> from him because he'd be rendered unclean constantly. So here is Peter now. The walls are breaking down in his life because he's willing to stay in the house of a tanner. And it probably didn't hurt that the house was by the sea. And then, and then the angel said, okay, I'm just reading too much. Okay, I'm sorry, but I'll try and behave myself the rest of the way. And the angel said, he will tell you what you must do. In other words, what you're doing and what you've done thus far isn't enough. You go send for this guy, and he'll tell you how to close the deal with God. And we know that when Peter shows up, what does he preach to him? preaches the gospel. So what do you need to do? God's going to add a list of 40 things to the things he's already doing in in verse 2. No, he needs to believe in the Lord for the forgiveness of sins. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. So when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. What's his response to the revelation of God? Immediate obedience. He really treats the voice of the Lord as something that's priceless and highly valuable. And I love it about this man. And the next day as they went, it's a 30-mile, 25- to 30-mile journey, so they probably got to start that first day, and then they're finishing up their journey about noon the next day. As they went on their journey, they drew near to the city of Joppa. Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. The sixth hour being, according to the Jewish way of, of thinking of time, was noon. So he goes on the housetop to pray, and you, and you see pictures of the Middle East today, or you go over there, and you see especially in that region right there along Along the coast, the housetops are flat. They use the roof areas as, as additional living space. And so you could go up and, uh, on the housetop and, and to pray. And because it was about noon, Peter became very hungry and wanted to eat. I've always suspected this about Peter, a man with a good appetite. But while they made ready, so he's hungry and they're still working to make lunch, He fell into a trance and he saw heaven opened and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners descending to him and let down to the earth. And on this sheet in it were all kinds, translation, clean and unclean animals according to the law of Moses. And in it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and the birds of the air. And a voice came to Peter and said to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Go ahead and kill the animals, prepare them to eat. And Peter said to him, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything uncommon or unclean. Now, it is interesting to note there, Jesus' uh, or Peter's response now to this vision from the Lord is not so, Lord. There's, a, there's an inconsistency in those three words. You can say, Uh, Not so, Alex. Uh, Not so, Joe Bacicalupi. Uh, You can say, not so, Mrs. McGillicuddy. You just can't say, not so, Lord. The only thing you're supposed to say to Lord is, yes, sir, Lord. (laughs) He's a little bit confused here uh, on things, but the Lord is going to use some repetition in his life to get through. And Peter says, not only, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. Now, he is very, very hungry while he sees this vision. And these animals that are clean and unclean are lowered before him. And, and what they represent, what God is, is speaking of, is it, they represent the whole broad cross-section of mankind. That God is interested in saving everybody. 
uh, clean, unclean, everybody that, that he wants to save. And Peter looks and says, listen, as hungry as I am, I'd rather die of starvation than eat of an unclean animal. I've never eaten of an unclean animal, not even in the time of his ministering with Jesus. Their, their diet was absolutely kosher. And Peter's attitude toward eating of an unclean animal represented the attitude of the Jews toward the Gentiles. I'd rather die than have anything to do with them. The voice said to him the second time, and God is, God is used in Peter's life. To, he just knows it always takes this guy three times to get it. The denial three times, you know, the recommissioning back in the ministry three times. Here's three times. This guy deals in threes. Now, they'd, had him, they'd put him on medication today. Praise the Lord, they didn't have it there on that. Peter ought to be Peter. He ought to be who he is. And the voice spoke to him again the second time and said, What God has cleansed, you must not call common. And this was done three times. The object was taken up into heaven again. Now, while Peter wondered within himself what this vision, which, uh, what this vision which he had seen meant, so he's confused as to the meaning of it, behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and they stood before the gate. So this is neat. I like it because as it relates to spiritual gifts and visions and dreams which the Lord can give. If he gives us something like that and you look at it and you go, I don't know what that means. Don't, don't worry about it. If it comes from God, he's going to make it clear what it means. There's no need to kind of, okay, I think it was this and I work and then this and this. No, if God gives you something like that, he'll bring what it means in the interpretation of it along. Just be patient. And so they came to this standing before the gate and they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. So the Lord knows that Peter's going to come down and he's going to be compelled to leave Joppa now and go to Caesarea with a bunch of Gentiles. And what the Lord is saying to Peter is, Listen, just chill, just relax, I'm in this. Just go with it, Peter. And watch what I do. Now, the neat thing about this is that when the Lord is at work, He works both ends. So he, He's worked the Cornelius end of things. Now He works the Peter end of things. And I never do anything in my own life on the basis of a word from somebody else. So somebody comes and says, listen, here's a word of the Lord to you. You need to do this and this. And this. So, you know, I'll take that to the Lord in prayer. But I want him to work my end, too, on it. And so the Lord works both ends in all of this, so everyone's on the same page. And then Peter went down to the men who had, who had been sent to him from Cornelius and said, Yes, I am he whom you seek. For what reason have you come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, one who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nations, nation of the Jews was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear words from you. So, all right, God's divinely instructed him. He's confirmed it with me. I'm supposed to go and speak to them. And so he invited them in and uh, they, uh, the Gentiles lodged with them. Again, a big step for a Jew to, uh, to have a Gentile in to spend the night in the house. And on the next day, Peter went away with them and became brethren, and some brethren from Joppa accompanying him, some Jewish brethren. And the following day, they entered Caesarea. Now, Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. It's a beautiful picture, isn't it? Here he is. God has told him, go send for this guy. He, and, and so here he's gathered all of his family and all of his friends in this room to wait for this guy that heaven has said is going to come and bring a message to him in answer to his prayer. 
And so that anticipation, just a rough, tough guy. He knows what it is to rule over people and get things accomplished and all this kind of stuff. And yet there's this real sensitivity toward God, the longing for the things of God. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him, fell down at his feet, and worshipped him. So he's filled with awe over this guy that it seems to be have an in with heaven, you know, and everything. I mean, how do you handle these kinds of people? I don't want to offend them. And so with some respect, he falls down at his feet and, and worships. And Peter, so gracious, he lifted him up. And you can, can't you just picture him, you know, Peter, this, you know, hulk of a man lifting him up from off of the ground and saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and he found many who had come together. All right, here's where light goes on for Peter. Peter's been raised as a Jew. And in that Jewish culture, all Gentiles are the same. They're all the same. You know, one Gentile, you know, all Gentiles. They're all dogs, one thing to the other. From one end of the world to the other. And here Peter walks in and he not only meets Cornelius, and in meeting Cornelius meets a Gentile who is very, very sincere in knowing God. But when he walks in and he sees that room jammed with people, he realizes not all Gentiles are alike. Not all anybody in this world is all alike. The world's made up of individuals. So all of these things, God's working, He's just taking them step by step beyond his own kind of national prejudice and, and all. And, and so, as he comes into this place, this is what it is that he sees. And he said to them, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or to go, in, uh, go to one of another nation. He, and, and they did. They understood the rules. The Jews didn't mingle with the Gentiles, much less come into their house. And then here's the great five words. But God has shown me. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. I don't think anybody can walk with the Lord for any length of time and maintain a prejudice against any other group in the rest of the world because there's going to be this love that God has for the whole world. God's going to make all of us conscious of it. And therefore I came without any objection as soon as I was sent for. And I ask then, for what reason have you sent me? And you look at at that verse there, and I think to myself, come on, Peter. Come on, Pentecost man. What do you mean? Why did he send for you? Don't you recognize an open door when you see an open door? When did you become Mr. Timid? What do you mean, why did they send you? You've got a most amazing opening to share the gospel. But again, he's tentative. He doesn't know what's God doing. Does God really love the Gentiles? Does God really want to save the Gentiles? I mean, God's having to take him by inches into this. But God's willing to take us by inches into this. He's a wonderful teacher. So, now, tell me again, I, I know I'm here and everything, and God told me I ought to come and everything now. Now, um, what's going on here? <laughs> and so Cornelius said, four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard. And your alms are remembered in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call Simon here, whose surname is Peter. He's lodging in the house of Simon a tanner by the sea. And when he comes, he will speak to you. And so, in other words, listen. God said you'd come and speak to us. He didn't say you'd come and ask questions. You're supposed to have the answers. So I sent to you immediately, and you've done well to come. Now, therefore, we're all present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. So here he is. He turns the entire meeting over to Peter now. His family, his friends, his everything turns it all over to Peter. And then Peter, he finally recognizes, oh, I ought to 
let him know about God's love here. He opened his mouth and he said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. Now, he's not saying that you can work for your salvation, that if you fear God and work righteousness, then you're accepted by him. He's saying that as a person fears God and works righteousness, has a sincere desire to know the truth about God, that God's willing to save anyone. God is willing to save anyone who has a sincere desire to know the Lord. Now, it's interesting because to me, Peter, and I think Peter has, um, he, he's without guile. And I think before he can even preach the gospel to them, he's kind of leveling with them. And he's just letting them know, listen, folks, I want you to know that I have come here and I'm going to preach the gospel to you, not because I'm so noble. God has had to drag me here to do what it is that I'm about to do for you right now to bring this message to you. And he said, the word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is the Lord of all. And that word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And so the account of Jesus, his life, his ministry was well known even among the Gentiles. So he says, you know, you've heard all about his life. His miracles, the supernaturalness of his life is reason enough to believe in him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, uh, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Though perfect, he was crucified. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly. To, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And so he preaches the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he, Jesus, who was ordained by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. Jesus is the Messiah. And to him, all the prophets prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. And so what does he do? He comes in and says, listen, here's what you need to do to have a relationship with God. This is what God has brought me to speak to you, and that is the necessity of believing in Jesus as Savior and as the Messiah, and that's the way to have the remission and the forgiveness of sins. Now, I think the word that exploded, in addition to the word believes, in the minds of these Gentiles, is the word that comes right before it in the New King James, and it's that word whoever For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth, He loves the whole world and any whosoever and the whole world that believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And for the first time now, the Gentiles realize that God is as interested in their salvation as the salvation of the Jews. And it was just like this, like the whole door of heaven was opened up to them. And while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who heard the word. He confirms the message of the gospel to them, and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. So they're looking at this, and this has been called the Gentile Pentecost. And they see that the gospel has been preached 
the Holy Spirit comes upon these Gentiles. They believe. They begin to speak in tongues and prophesy in the same way as the Jewish Pentecost. And they're astonished. It's just a slack-jawed, you know, paint me green and call me Gumby astonishment that God is willing to save the Gentiles. It's an amazing thing to them. We're, we're used to it. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. And then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And then they asked him to stay a few days. And so saved and water baptized and, and uh, the light goes on not only for the Gentiles but now for the Jews that God is interested in the Gentiles. You would have thought that, man, by the time the news got back to Jerusalem, that God is interested in saving the whole world and saving Gentiles, that they would have thought, man, it's, we're so glad that that's happened. We were wondering how we were going to reach those Gentiles, how, how we could get Gentiles to listen to us as Jews. That was a real big thing that we were struggling with. They weren't struggling with that. They weren't struggling over the Gentiles at all. And so in chapter 11, verse 1, and we'll move through this very quickly. You relax. When the apostles and the brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God, instead of being excited over this, instead of aiming, all right, how are we going to reach these Gentiles? They're upset. And when Peter came to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision, they contended with him. They began to fight with him over this fact that he had gone in to the uncircumcised men, and then he had ate, ate with them there in verse 3. You went into a Gentile's house, and not only that, but you ate with them? And the Jews had that mystical um, uh, way of relating to eating. When, when you eat, for the most of part, we're Gentiles in this room. When you eat, do you sense anything mystical happening in someone else's life? No, you're eating, and if something mystical happens with you, that's great. But, but for the Jews, what they did is you would have all these, you know, this pita bread would be out in the sauces, and you'd take a piece off, and you'd dip it in the sauce, and you'd eat it. Somebody else would take a piece from that same loaf and put it in the sauce. Someone else would, and you're all partaking of the same sauce and the same loaf. And how they viewed that is because the same sauce and the same loaf is in you that is in me, that it's created a mystical union. So that's why the Jews would never eat with a Gentile. They didn't want any union, mystical or otherwise, with a Gentile. And that was their beef with Jesus when they came to him and say, this guy eats with publicans and sinners. That was the problem. And so they're really upset with him. And Peter explained it to them in order from the beginning, saying, I, listen, I was minding my own business. I mean, I, I was just out there raising people from the dead. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, an object descending like a great sheet let down from heaven by four corners, and it came to me. And when I observed it intently and considered, I saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and the birds and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, Not so, Lord. He's honest, isn't he? For nothing uncommon nor unclean has at any time entered my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, What God has cleansed you must not call common. Now this was done three times, and all were drawn up again into heaven. And at that very moment, three men stood before the house where I was, having been sent to me from Caesarea. And then the Spirit told me to go with them, doubting nothing. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house who said to him, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who will tell you words by which you and all your household will be saved. And as I began to speak, and then I love these four words, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. Listen, I was just there speaking. I was obedient to God. This is all God's doing. God did this whole thing. You don't have a beef with me. You have a beef with the Holy Spirit. 
And then I remembered the words of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then speaking of Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and then the baptism of the Holy Spirit for what purpose? To reach all the world, to reach the nations. So on that long walk from Joppa back to Jerusalem, all this starts to work through Peter's heart and through his mind. And what does he realize? There's a biblical base for this. There's a biblical basis for the conversion of the, Jew, the Gentiles. That this is what God, Jesus was speaking to us all along. And if, therefore, God gave them the same gift as He gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? <laughs> if God wants to hang out with Gentiles, He didn't have to clear it through me. And so if He wants to have friendship with Gentiles, if He wants to put His Holy Spirit inside of Gentiles, God is God. He gets to do what He wants. And that's His twofold answer is, number one, what God did there in Caesarea has a biblical basis. And number two, even if it didn't have a biblical base, God gets to do what He wants. He can save who He wants. And when they heard these things, they became silent. There was no more contending with him. There's an old saying, when you've been put down, sit down. Kind of what happens here. And they glorified God, saying, Then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. And that message is all the way through the Old Testament and all the way through the teaching of Jesus but it took this to cause the light to go on for them. Isn't it amazing how many times you can read the Bible and then, you know, one day after you've read it however many times, then you see that thing in that verse. <laughs> and it's just the Lord doing the same thing here, just giving us revelation by degrees to His heart and to His will. Now, those who were scattered after the persecution that rose, arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who when they had come to Antioch, they spoke to the Hellenists there, the Hellenistic Jews, preaching the Lord Jesus, and the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number of Hellenistic Jews believed in Jesus as the Messiah and turned to the Lord. And so now the gospel heads off into Antioch, and Antioch was sin city of its day. And so here they come, and they begin to preach the gospel there. God's with them. A great number believe and turn to the Lord. And then news of these things came into the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch to check and see, you know, is this thing right and is this really of the Lord. And when he came and he had seen the grace of God, he was glad and he encouraged them all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. And then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And so it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. And now from this particular point in the book of Acts, the focus is going to move away from Jerusalem for the most part. And now the focus is going to go on Antioch. And it's fascinating as Barnabas comes to Antioch and he sees this is the real deal. People are getting saved here in this city. And as he looked at the needs in the city of Antioch, and I'm convinced, of course, as we see the record will bear witness to it, that he thought to himself, I know the perfect man for this need. Saul of Tarsus, later to become the Apostle Paul. And he goes to Tarsus and he brings Paul to Antioch and he spends a year with Paul teaching them the things that pertain to the Lord. So they're saved now. And what does a saved person need? A saved person 
It's already been preached to. Now what they need is to be taught the things of the Lord. And so a year of teaching now going into their lives by Barnabas and by Saul of Tarsus. Now, Paul, by this time in the record, he's been saved for ten years approximately. This is about ten years after his conversion. And God has, and there's a tendency to look at Paul that he got saved, and though there was that initial spurt in his ministry to doing different things in Damascus and later in Jerusalem, the fact of the matter is that almost immediately after that, the Lord took him aside into Arabia for a period of years and then took him back into Tarsus, and he kind of just laid low for ten years. And what was God doing? God was preparing him for the ministry that he had called him to. You don't have a ministry like Paul's and you just jump into it right after you get saved. God is spending ten years now, what? Giving him a message. Something to speak to people once he gets to where God is going to take them. (laughs) Remember in the Old Testament when there was the battle that was going on? Absalom had had led the rebellion against David and everything. And then... uh, Joab, uh, uh, you know, leads in the, in the killing of Absalom in the situation. And the news is to, supposed to be brought back to David. And, and then they send the w- one messenger to take the message. And then there's a young guy there and he's saying, can I go, Joab? Can I go? Can I take the message to David and everything? You know, and, and he, doesn't, he doesn't know what happened. He doesn't have a message yet. And he says, you, don't, you know, you don't have a message yet. Don't go. And, and just... Just chill. You're got to, it'll be another day for you. No, I want to go. I want to go. I want to run. I want to run. You know, and, and he could run faster than everybody. He says, Joab, just go. So he outruns the other guy that has the full message. And he gets to David first. And David says, you know, tell me what happened. And he said, well, you know, let, let all of your enemies have the end of, you know, all that are engaged in this rebellion. And David said, yeah, but what about my son? He said, I don't know about your son. David said, and because he was gracious, King could have said, take his head off. What's this? He just says, you go stand over here. And he allowed the next messenger to come up and deliver the message. And God is always wanting to protect us from the embarrassment of that situation. So he takes time to develop a message here. And then in that ten years of preparation, here comes Paul. And he's ready now to become the focus, really, of the book of Acts after this. And Antioch becomes the great missionary church of the New Testament period. And after these days... Uh, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch and then one of them named Agabus stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world which Luke tells us also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. And then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea and this they also did and sent it to the elders by the hands of of Barnabas and Saul. So the love for the body of Christ there in the early church and uh, that recognition that they were all in it together and when hard times came to the believers there in Judea, other believers in other parts of the world sent assistance to them. Well, as you might imagine, we will stop there tonight and we'll pick it up in chapter 12 next time. Will the worship team come forward and lead us in worship as we allow the ministry of the Holy Spirit to continue as we close out the service.